This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on Carolina Impact. Mammograms may not be the only way to detect breast cancer. Up ahead, I'll show you a new blood test that may play a role in early detection. Plus, a new program in Cabarrus County has paramedics making house calls and is reducing hospital readmissions and saving taxpayers money. And we head to Davidson to meet a man who's tuned hundreds of pianos across Charlotte. Find out what it takes to do that. Please don't go anywhere. Carolina Impact starts right now. Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Good evening, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. These days, it seems we all know at least one breast cancer survivor. According to the American Cancer Society, one in eight women will develop the condition. A local doctor designed a test to help detect breast cancer in a non-traditional way. Carolina Impact's Danielle Koser shows us how it works. It's a quiet afternoon at this art studio in downtown Mount Holly. At a back table, Melinda Murphy blends blue paint on a wooden cross. Doing crafts just kept my mind busy on what I could do next, rather than dwell on what you were going through. In oceans deep, my faith will stay. Murphy turned to crafts to take her mind off the harsh side effects of chemotherapy and radiation. She was diagnosed with breast cancer after her yearly mammogram in 2013. About three days later, I had to go back and they told me it was cancer. After surgery, she started chemotherapy, followed by 33 rounds of radiation. Treatment every day except Saturday and Sunday. During months of grueling treatment, Murphy focused on the works of art she created while the chemo and radiation destroyed cancer cells. It was a long haul. Today, she's cancer free, but that doesn't mean she's worry free. Murphy says she's on pins and needles every six months, waiting for the results of her mammogram to make sure the cancer hasn't come back. That's why she started using a new product called Agura Personal Score, a test designed to help detect breast cancer. It's a blood test, very simple blood test. Meet Dr. Pinku Mukherjee. She and a team of researchers spent five years testing thousands of blood and tissue samples before launching a product in May. The test measures a protein called TMUC1, which is present in the tumors of more than 90% of all breast cancer patients. Dr. McCurgy recommends taking the test every six to 12 months. What it will do is give peace of mind that I don't have a tumor. The test is only available with a doctor's prescription. Patients get their blood drawn at a doctor's office that offers the test. Then the office ships the sample to a lab at UNC Charlotte where it's processed. When the sample comes back, we take the tube of blood and we spin it in a centrifuge to get the serum. Once the serum is separated from the blood cells, researchers test it to measure the amount of protein. The higher the protein level, the darker the color on the test. If a patient's protein level is increasing or already too high, McCurgy recommends following up with a doctor to schedule an ultrasound or MRI. Otherwise, you will never know, and then you'll only know when you feel a big lump. And once you feel the lump, it's already late. It's already at the stage three. McCurgy says the test is especially helpful for women with dense breast tissue, like Murphy. According to the American Cancer Society, women with high breast density are four to five times more likely to get breast cancer than women with low breast density. And dense breast tissue makes it harder for radiologists to spot a problem area on a scan. That's because dense breast tissue shows up white, the same color as a mass or a tumor. And you're basically trying to find a, a snowflake in a blizzard. And this test enables you to, to do that uh, pretty effectively. Dr. Jamie Villarreal is the first in Gaston County to offer the test. The test helps us identify a cancer in areas where it's very difficult to because the mammogram can miss things and so the blood test just aids us in, in identifying a potential problem. 
However, the American Cancer Society says experts don't agree any other tests need to be done in addition to mammograms in women with dense breasts. Doctors diagnose nearly 250,000 women with breast cancer each year. Nearly 40,000 die from it. It's just a, another tool to try to fight this awful disease. The test cost about $200 and isn't covered by insurance. But Murphy says that's a small price to pay for some peace of mind. It keeps you from worrying. I mean, I was always at top when I go for my mammograms. She took the test for the first time in August and received her baseline report about a week later, which fell within the normal range. So far, so good. She plans to take the test every six months in hopes of avoiding the shock of another diagnosis. A lot of people think it's the end, but uh, it's more like a change. Everything is different as far as the way you look at things. I want to just educate right now more women, more doctors, so that they know the benefits that this test can have. McCurgy stresses the test isn't meant to be a self-diagnosis, but rather to help improve the partnership between physicians and patients, empowering women to take their health into their own hands. For Carolina Impact, I'm Danielle Koser reporting. Thanks so much, Danielle. In other medical news, imagine if you were hospitalized for a heart attack or a stroke, and once you were sent home, there wasn't anyone there to help care for you. Well, a few counties across our region have implemented community paramedicine programs. As Carolina Impact's Jeff Rivenbark explains, these programs not only benefit recovering patients, but save taxpayers money. Flashing lights, sirens, and speeding ambulances. When you see this, it usually means someone's in trouble. Paramedic Ann Coffey responds to people in need, but she's not in an ambulance. And a typical day for her... It kind of depends on how many patients need to be seen that day. I'll be sent faxes from the hospital, um, and they might communicate with me a little bit about that patient beforehand. As a community paramedic for Cabarrus County EMS, Coffee visits discharged hospital patients the 24th song. like Henry Crowder. The earth is the Lord and the fullness there, the world and they that dwell therein. Earlier this year, he suffered three strokes, but now he's much stronger and enjoys quiet time at home reading his Bible. Into the hills of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place. If I don't read but just two or three verses of it, it means a lot. Another thing that brings him joy is when Ann stops by to check in on him. Hey, Henry. After a bit of small talk. You taking all your medicines like you're supposed to? She gets down to business. OK, tell me about this one. Followed by oh, really? a blood pressure check. At 74, Henry lives alone with little family contact. That's why her visits mean so much. Because, you know, a lot of people didn't got time for you. She's so kind. She's so wonderful. It makes you feel good to think you have someone to talk to. Blood pressure's looking good. It was 138 over 80. Well, that's good. About the only thing Henry dreads. Oh, boy. Mm. Getting his finger oh. pricked for a diabetes blood sugar test. And within seconds. 95, good deal. He gets a good report. We try to get to the patient before they have an emergency and make sure that they understand all the things they need to do to keep themselves healthy to prevent something like a heart attack, stroke, or accidents. When Henry was released from the hospital after his first stroke, he got a little confused about taking his medications. Uh, it kind of became more of a regular thing to come and check on him and make sure he was doing the things he needed to do. The compassion piece is paramount with what we do. As a supervisor for Cabarrus County EMS, Captain Justin Bryan says community paramedics have responded to about 400 house calls since the program started in September 2015. Sometimes they sit and listen to folks talk for an hour, and they really don't have a solution, but they've listened. Paramedics work closely with Carolina's healthcare system Northeast and Concord. Without their referrals and without the integration there, the program would not be as successful as it is. While nurses typically call discharged hospital patients, sometimes it can be hard to tell how well they're doing or what they need. Our stroke navigator, which is a stroke certified nurse, calls the patients after they've been discharged 
And often during that phone call, she would say, you know, they sound okay, they tell me they're taking their medicines the right way, but something just doesn't feel right if we only had a set of eyes. That's where community paramedics make a difference. From 2014 to 2015, stroke readmissions at CHS Northeast increased by 13%. Since the program started last year, there's been a 24% decrease, not to mention easing some of the financial burden on the healthcare system. Our goal is to keep them out of the hospital, uh, the cost savings to the patient, as well as the fact that we're not tying up a hospital bed or an ER bed for hours, even days at a time. Here's another cost savings. By having dedicated personnel who can go out and do these home visits, uh, we're able to reduce the number of 911 calls uh, for frequent users. Every trip a community paramedic makes to someone's home prevents racking up unnecessary miles on ambulances, which can cost more than $160,000 to replace. That provides our um, paramedic trucks their availability to be able to respond to emergency calls. The community paramedic program cost about $131,000 annually, but most funding so far has come from the Cannon Foundation and CHS Northeast. In addition to Cabarrus County, Mecklenburg, Lincoln, Rowan, and Cleveland counties have some kind of community paramedicine program in place, as well as 15 other counties across the state. As for Henry, knowing someone like Ann cares about his recovery... It, it, it means a lot to me. It means a lot. He's very special to me, too. I'm really thankful that this program has brought me back to the level of being able to really communicate with patients and talk to them and, and have that level of care with them. To see him being able to take care of himself and do things on his own, it's huge. I mean, because ultimately that's what you want. You want people to be back to that level where they don't need to be taken care of. Despite all he's been through this year, Henry feels better knowing it won't be long before a community paramedic shows up to make sure he's okay. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jeff Rivenbark reporting. Thanks so much, Jeff. Joining me now is Captain Will Cannon with Cabarrus County EMS. Captain Cannon, thanks so much for your time. We appreciate all that you do to help our community. Thank you for having me. Talk to us a little bit. What is the difference between community paramedic and the EMS response? Community paramedic uh, provides us the opportunity to be proactive. So typically when someone is suffering a medical emergency, they dial 911. Uh, we send an ambulance to respond to handle their acute medical need. The community paramedic program allows us to respond to assist the individual before there's an emergency. So, but it's after some sort of they've had a medical issue and there's some ongoing maintenance that is needed? Yes, ma'am. Oftentimes we see these patients as referrals from CHS Northeast. Uh, it could be either a post-stroke patient, a post-coronary artery bypass graft surgical patient, uh, or a COPD patient. Uh, however, we also see patients um, that were not post-discharge patients that we have identified have unmet needs throughout many of our various avenues to determine that a patient needs some additional assistance. It may be situations like diabetics and people who have ongoing acute issues. Yes, ma'am, absolutely. Help us understand what the cost savings is because it probably prevents a lot of people from having to go to the emergency room. Yes, ma'am, so uh, a main thrust of this program is to reduce readmissions to the hospital. So our community paramedics will be able to come in and fill in a gap between when that patient is discharged from the hospital uh, until that they are fully on their way to recovery. Um, additionally, it provides us an opportunity to see patients who uh, regularly call 911 for um, various medical emergencies to proactively um, fix a problem before it becomes an emergency. You know, we saw it in the story that Jeff had earlier. What a beautiful thing for a lot of these older in-home people who, who may not have anyone at home to even help them to go through the process of, of continued care for them. To, you develop relationships with these people as well, don't you? Yes, ma'am, absolutely. Absolutely, in many ways, our community paramedics are a lifeline for people with uh, very little support systems. And how long has this been going on and, and are we able to expand it? Yes, ma'am, we, well, we have been uh, doing this program for roughly a year and a half. Uh, and we do hope to expand it in the future with additional community paramedics so we can see more patients. About how many folks are you able to see in a year? So we see around uh, 250 patients um, and we hope to grow that number each year. So this is kind of like the old fashioned doctor who makes house calls. Very much so, yes ma'am, absolutely. So what's old is new again. Yes ma'am. What an interesting concept and in how that feeling of support and providing something very different and very unique and to have the cost savings, that probably is a, is a savings to the public as well. Absolutely. 
Um, the main thrust of the program is to encourage an environment of healing in the home. And anything that we can do to proactively meet the needs, both medically, uh, psychologically, um, emotionally, to assist our patients in Cabarrus County to stay healthy and happy and to have a good quality of life um, is the true impetus for the program. Are you familiar, is this happening in other parts of our state? Yes, ma'am, it is. Community paramedicine in general is a relatively new concept in emergency medical services. About a fifth of the counties in North Carolina have active community paramedic programs now with many more in developmental stages. If people in your county are interested in just becoming aware of it now, is there a number that they can call to possibly be included in the program? Yes, ma'am. We do have a um, specialty services supervisor who uh, fields calls, and we have a special line for community paramedic interest. Captain Cannon, help us understand what is the one thing that you want people to understand about this program before we run out of time? Yes, ma'am. The one thing that we want people to understand about the community paramedic program is that we are here to be the patient advocate to be collaborative, to help meet unmet needs, to help connect our citizens with the resources in their community, and to truly foster um, the ability for the individuals to be healthy in their homes and remain independent, healthy, and happy. Another great resource throughout our region. Captain Will Cannon from the Cabarrus County EMS, thank you so much for bringing this story to us. We appreciate all thank that you do. You. Thank you very much. Well, I didn't live here back then, I've heard that 20 years ago there weren't a lot of dining options in Uptown Charlotte. Our population explosion and business growth have brought a bounty of new restaurants to Uptown. Well, one of the first to open during Uptown's rebirth was Mert's Heart and Soul. To this day, it remains one of Uptown's most unique dining destinations. Carolina Impact's Jason Terzis takes us inside. It's midday in Uptown. As Queen Charlotte looks on, office buildings begin emptying out, business people head off to lunch, and regulars head into one of Uptown's most unique spots, Mert's Heart and Soul. If you come early, you can beat the crowd and sit back and relax a bit. Outside, a neon sign simply says, eat. Inside, this dimly lit, eclectic place has a little bit of everything. License plates, homemade signs, artwork, there's even a bike. But it's not the decor that has been bringing people in for the last 18 years. Uh, you know, you invite somebody to go, where you want to eat? Well, let's go to Mert's Heart and Soul. I mean, how cool is that? James Bazell started cooking in high school after a friend convinced him to take a home economics class for two main reasons. Are we going to get to eat and meet girls? James has been cooking ever since. In the early 90s, he moved with his family from Athens, Georgia to Charlotte, taking a job cooking at the Holiday Inn uptown. And that's when we started catering. And we did catering for about two years. And then we got our first restaurant, uh, GA on Tryon. That was 1996. One of the regulars back in those days was then Nations Bank president Hugh McCall. At the time, Uptown didn't have many restaurants. Bank officials then approached Bazell with a proposal. Would he consider relocating to North College Street if the bank assisted? I was a little reluctant at first. College had nothing. It was dead. If you was hot, you was on Tryon. Bazell took a chance. And in 1998, Mert's Heart and Soul opened its doors and was named after a former customer, Myrtle Lockhart. And she was flat, flashy. She was in her late 70s. She was witty. She, she, she was really cool. And so when I was trying to think of something, I told the design guy, I said, just try Mertz. I was born, I said, just try Mertz on it. And he did the Mertz in the, in the script we got now. And he had a heart and soul. And me and my wife seen it. We said that's the name of the restaurant. So how often does James mistakenly get called Mert? All the time. Mert's distinguishes itself from traditional soul food restaurants and any other place uptown by offering a combination of southern soul food and low country dishes. What separates us from others and makes us who we are and unique will have to be the type of dishes that we prepare. Mert's most popular dishes include salmon cakes, mac and cheese, shrimp and grits, sole rolls, and fried chicken. Any chicken dish that they cook up is going to be off the hook. It's soul food, but to me it's just like southern cooking, and it sort of reminds me a lot of sort of how we ate as a, when I was a kid. Another popular item is the collard greens, which are delivered fresh each day from South Carolina. They're boiled with olive oil, garlic, onions, and vinegar. He's found a really cool niche of flavors and foods. The way things are prepared remind me a lot of my, my grandmother's. But the most popular item at Mertz isn't even a main dish. It's the cornbread. Everybody talk about the cornbread. Well, they have the best cornbread in Charlotte, 
pants down. I thought our number one seller was going to be our salmon cakes. Nobody tops their cornbread. I mean, it's worth, it's worth driving down here. It's never cold. It's never hard. It's always right out the oven, and people love it. Well, there's cornbread, and then there's cornbread that has that tastes like cake. Always served hot with melted butter, the cornbread is Mert's number one item. The secret ingredient, mayonnaise, which keeps it lighter, almost cake-like. And speaking of cake, there's plenty of those to go around too. A local bakery brings them in. They're a huge hit with customers. My wife, when she's she works downtown and she loves their cakes. So there's been occasions where I'd get a couple a couple pieces of cake to go and we'd have, we'd, uh, we'd have cake when we got home, you know. So. And that's a big treat for her, so I get extra points for that. Over the years, Mertz has become a popular spot, not only with locals, but with visiting celebrities as well. Kevin Hart, the Foo Fighters, Mariah Carey, Questlove, Deborah Cox, visiting NBA teams. Even Hillary Clinton stopped by during a recent campaign visit. Local celebs like Cam Newton and Ron Rivera have also been in. I'm from old school Southern hospitality. You speak to everybody, you ask them how they're doing, you tell them thank you for coming. The goal for the Bazell family has always been to serve great comfort food where customers feel at home. I know the hard work and dedication that both my parents put into this place and what they wanted it to become. So seeing them being able to live out their dream, it is, it is it's, it's, it's rewarding. It's really rewarding. 18 years later and with lots of regulars and out-of-town guests, Mertz continues to give customers exactly what they want. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jason Turtis reporting. Thanks so much for making my mouth water, Jason. Well, changing gears now. When James Baker moved to Charlotte back in the early 80s, he took a piano tuning course at Central Piedmont Community College. Little did he know that becoming a registered piano technician would change the course of his life. Carolina Impact's Doug Stacker caught up with James recently at Davidson College. In any performance, musicians are looking for the best possible sound here. I'm Laura Dunnigan, a student at Davidson College, and I've been playing piano for 15 years. Pianists will be able to tell when a piano has been tuned well because the voice of the piano will have clear and perfect color. I'm so used to hearing in-tune pianos that it's easy to pick out an out-of-tune one. I tell my customers, I think most people have the ear to tune, they just need to train it. What they don't have is patience. My name is James Baker, I'm a professional piano tuner. I went to school in 1987 to learn, and I've been doing it ever since. When I was in school, we had to tune 50 pianos to get out of the course. It would take us days. I learned by ear. When I became an associate technician for the symphony, I bought the computer. When I was with the symphony, just about every artist that came in wanted something different. I tried to have the piano in a mid state of readiness when they got there, and then they would either want it up or down. Over the years, I have tuned for a Elton John. Roberta Flack. Killing me softly with his song. Killing me softly. John Legend. I give you all of me. I so out of pop music, I didn't know who that was. I was totally, was very famous. A piano I tune regularly, I can do in an hour. Pianos have different numbers of strings in them. The average is between 230 and 240. In the bass, there's always just one string per note. Most of the piano is plain steel wire, three strings per note. And they do that to spread out the tension across the whole piano and also volume. If the bass strings were not wound with copper to make them vibrate slower, piano would need to be 27 feet long. The tension on pianos is very great. The string can range 180 up to 400 pounds, depending on the model of piano. Everything from a spinet piano might have 16 tons of pull on the back, and a, and a concert grand like this would have 40 tons. 
When I first started, I didn't really want to hear the pianos I had tuned because it really just showed off my shortcomings. Now, I can just enjoy the performance. I'm not paying attention to the tuning. The tuning is considered an art. It is up to the technician to bring out the personality of every different piano might have, and that takes years of experience. And I am still learning, even though I've got nearly 30 years now, tuning and voicing and regulating is something you, you're just constantly learning more. Thanks so much, Doug. It's great to learn what it takes to make a piano sound great. Well, before we say goodnight, we want to remind you to please friend us on Facebook for your chance to win monthly prizes. This month, we're giving away a DVD set of Poldark, featuring seasons one and two. You know, Poldark is my new favorite masterpiece series. I like to call Russ Pull Dark and Handsome, and he's such a good man. Well, thanks so much for joining us this evening. We always appreciate your time, and we look forward to seeing you back here again next time on Carolina Impact. Good night, my friends. of PBS Charlotte.